Hey everybody, uh, it's Mr. Heiser here, and I'm really excited because I get to actually uh, read to you the very first three chapters of our brand new One School One book uh, titled Escape from Mr. Lemoncello's Library. I'm really excited to be able to read this, and I purposely haven't read any of this book yet because I want to read it with you guys, our students and our parents and our families. So um, let's go ahead and dig into this. Um, this is written by Chris Grabenstein, and uh, we got some exciting things about him that are coming up as well. Maybe we'll even get a special uh, opportunity to talk with him at some point. So I'm going to go ahead and start off with chapter one. Remember, I've not read any of this, so I don't know any of the characters or anything like that. So um, I'll try my best to uh, play along with uh, this book. I'm really excited. Here we go. Page one on chapter one. This is how Kyle Keeley got grounded for a week. First, he took a shortcut through his mother's favorite rose bush. Yes, the thorns hurt, but having crashed through the brambles and trampled a few petunias, he had a five-second jump on his oldest brother, Mike. Both Kyle and his big brother knew exactly where to find what they needed to win the game. Inside the house. Kyle had already found the pine cone to complete his outdoors round and he was pretty sure Mike had snagged his yellow flower. Hey, it was just, it was June. Dandelions were everywhere. Give it up, Kyle, shouted Mike as the others dashed up the driveway. As the brothers dashed up the driveway, you don't stand a chance. Mike zoomed past Kyle and headed for the front door, wiping out, oh, there's the bell. Wiping out Kyle's temporary lead. Of course he did. 17-year-old 17, 17 Mike Keeley was a total jock, a high school superstar, football, basketball, baseball. If it had a ball, Mike Keeley was good at it. Kyle, who was 12, wasn't the star of anything. Kyle's older brother, Curtis, who was 15, was still trapped over in the neighbor's yard dealing with their dog. Curtis was the smartest Keeley. But for his outdoors round, he had pulled the always unfortunate your neighbor's dog toy card. Any dog card was basically the same as lose a turn. As for why the three, three Keeley brothers were running around their neighborhood on a Sunday afternoon like crazed lunatics, grabbing all sorts of wacky stuff, well, it was their mother's fault. She was the one who had suggested, if you boys are bored, play a board game. So Kyle had gone down into the basement and dug up one of his old-time favorites, Mr. Lemoncello's Indoor-Outdoor Scavenger Hunt. It had been a huge hit for Mr. Lemoncello, the master game maker. Kyle and his brothers had played it so much when they were younger, Mrs. Keeley wrote to Mr. Lemoncello's company for a refresher pack of clue cards. The new cards listed all sorts of different bizarro stuff you need to find, like an adult's droopy underpants one dirty dish, and a rotten banana peel. At the end of the game, the losers had to put everything back exactly where the items had been found. It was an official rule, printed inside the top of the box and made winning the game is that much more important. While Curtis was stranded next door trying to talk the neighbor's Doberman Twinkie out of his favorite uh, tug toy, Kyle and Mike were both searching for the same two items because... For the final round, all the players were given the same riddle card. That day's riddle, even though it was a card Kyle had never seen before, had been extra easy. Find two coins from 1982 that add up to 30 cents, and one of them cannot be a nickel. Duh, the answer was a quarter and a nickel because the riddle said only one of them couldn't be a nickel. So to win, Kyle had to find a 1982 quarter and a 1982 nickel. Also easy. Their dad kept an apple cider jug filled with loose change down in the basement workshop. That's why Kyle and Mike were racing to get there first. Mike bolted through the front door and Kyle grinned. He loved playing games against his big brothers. As the youngest, it was just about the only chance he ever got to beat them fair and square. Board games leveled the playing field. You needed a good roll of the dice, a lucky draw of cards, and some smarts. But if things went your way and you gave it your all, anyone could win. 
especially today since Mike had blown his lead by, by choosing the standard route down to the basement. He'd gone through the front door, tear to the back of the house, bound down the steps, and then down to their dad's workshop. Kyle, on the other hand, would take a shortcut. He hopped over a couple of boxy shrubs and kicked open uh, the low-to-the-ground casement window. He heard something crackle when his tennis shoe hit the window pane, and he couldn't worry about it. He had to beat his big brother. So he crawled through the narrow opening, dropped to the floor, and scrabbled over to the workbench where he found the jug, dumped out the coins, and started sifting through the sea of pennies, nickels, dimes, and quarters. Score! Kyle quickly uncovered the 1982 nickel. He tucked it into his shirt pocket and sent pennies, nickels, and dimes skidding across the floor as he concentrated on quarters. 2010, 2003, 1986. Come on, come on, he muttered. The workshop door swung open. What the? Mike was surprised to see that Kyle had beaten him to the coin jar. Mike fell to his knees and started searching for his own coins just as Kyle shouted, got it, and plucked a 1982 quarter out of the pile. What about the nickel, demanded Mike, and Kyle pulled it out of his shirt pocket. You went through the window, said a voice from outside. It was Curtis, kneeling in the flower beds. Yeah, said Kyle. I was going to do that. The shortest distance between two points is a straight line. I used to say that a lot when I was a math teacher. I can't believe you won, moaned Mike, who wasn't used to losing anything. Well, said Kyle, standing up and strutting a little, believe it, brother, because now you two losers have to put all the junk back. I am not talk taking this back to Twinkie, said Curtis. He held up a very slimy, knotted rope. Oh, yes, you are, said Kyle. Oh, yes, you are, said Kyle, because you lost. Oh, sure, you thought about using the window. Um, Kyle, mumbled Curtis, you might want to shut up. What? Come on, Curtis, don't be such a sore loser. Just because I was the only one who took the shortcut and kicked open the window and... You did this, Kyle? A new face appeared in the window. Their dad's. Heh heh heh, chuckled Mike behind Kyle. You broke the glass? Their father sounded ticked off. Well, guess who's going to pay to have this window replaced? And that's why Kyle Keeley had 50 cents deducted from his allowance for the rest of the year and got grounded for a week. Chapter 2. Halfway across town, Dr. Yanina Zinchenko, the world-famous librarian, was walking briskly through the cavernous building that was only days away from its gala grand opening. Alexandriaville's new public library had been under construction for five years. All work had been done with the utmost secrecy under the tightest possible security. One crew did the exterior renova renovations on what uh, on what had been the uh, small Ohio city's most magnificent building, the Gold Leaf Bank. Other crews, carpenters, masons, electricians, and plumbers worked on the interior. No single construction crew stayed on the job longer than six weeks. No crew knew any of the other crews, what any of the other crews had done or would be doing. And when all those crews were finished, several super secret covert crews highly paid workers who would deny ever having been in the library, Alexandriaville, or even the state of Ohio, stealthily applied the final touches. Dr. Zinchenko had supervised the construction project for her, for her employer, a very eccentric, some would say loony, billionaire. Only she knew all the marvel, marvels and wonders the incredible new library would hold and hide within its walls. Dr. Zinchenko was a tall woman with blazing red hair. She wore an expensive, custom-tailored business suit, jazzy high-heeled shoes, a Bluetooth earpiece, and glasses with thick red f uh, frames, heels clicking on the marble floor, fingers tapping on the glass of her very advanced tablet computer. Dr. Zinchenko strode past the, count the control center's red door under an arch, and into the breathtakingly large circular reading room beneath the library's three-story tall rotunda. The bank building, which provided the shelf for the new library, had been built in 1931. 
with towering Corinthian columns, an arched entryway, lots of fancy trim, and a mammoth shimmering gold dome. The building looked like it belonged next door to the triumphant memorials in Washington, D.C. Not on this small Ohio town's quaint streets. Dr. Zinchenko paused to stare up at the library's most stunning visual effect, the Wonder Dome. Ten wedge-shaped high-definition video screens, as brilliant as those in Times Square, lined the underbelly of the dome like so many orange slices. Each screen could operate independently or as part of a spectacular whole. The Wonder Dome could become the constellations of the night sky, a flight through the clouds that made viewers below sense that the whole building had somehow lifted off the ground, or, in Dewey Decimal Mode, ten sections depicting vibrant and constantly changing images associated with each category in the library cataloging system. I have the final numbers for the fourth sector of the Wonder Dome in Dewey mode, Dr. Zinchenko said into her Bluetooth, Bluetooth earpiece, 364.1092. She carefully over-enunciated each word to make certain the video artist knew what specific numbers would occasionally drift across the fourth wedge amid the swirling social sciences montage featuring a floating judge's gavel, a tumbling teacher's apple, and a gentle snowfall of holiday icons. The numbers, however, should not appear until 11 a.m. Sunday. Is that clear? Yes, Dr. Zinchenko, replied the uh, tinny voice in her ear. Next, Dr. Zinchenko studied the holographic statues projected into black crepe-lined re recesses cut into the massive stone piers that supported the arched windows from which the Wonder Dome rose. Why are Shakespeare and Dickens still here? They're not on the list for opening night. Sorry, replied the library, library's director of holographic imagery, who was also on the conference call. I'll fix it. Thank you. Exiting the rotunda, the librarian entered the children's room. It was dim with only a few uh, a few work lights glowing, but Dr. Zinchenko had memorized the layout of the miniature tables and was able to march without bumping her shins into the story corner for a final check on her recently installed geese. The flock of six audio animatronic goslings, fluffy robots with ping-pongish eyeballs created for the new library by Imagineers who used to work at Disney World, stood perched atop an angled bookcase in the corner. Mother Goose in her bonnet and granny glasses was frozen in the center. This is Library One, said Dr. Zinchenko, loud enough for the microphones hidden in the ceiling to pick up her voice. Initiate story time sequence. The geese sprang to mechanical life. Nursery rhyme. The geese honked out, ba ba black sheep, in six-part harmony. Treasure Island? The birds yo-ho-hoed their way through 15 men on a dead man's chest. Dr. Zinchenko clapped her hands. The rollicking geese stopped singing and swaying. One more, she said, squinting she saw a book sitting on a nearby table. Walter the Farting Dog. The six geese spun around and farted their tail feathers flipping up in sync with the noisy blasts. Eef. Excellent. End story time. The geese slumped back into their sleep mode. Dr. Zinchenko made one more tick on her computer tablet. Her final punch list was growing shorter and shorter, which was a very good thing. The library's grand opening was set for Friday night. Dr. Z and her army of associates had... Only a few days left to smooth out any kinks in the library's complex operating system. Suddenly, Dr. Zinchenko heard a low, rumbling growl. Turning around, she was eyeball to icy blue eyeball with a very rare white tiger. Dr. Zinchenko sighed and touched her Bluetooth earpiece. Miss G, this is Dr. Z. What is our white Bengal tiger doing in the children's department? I see. Apparently, there was a slight misunderstanding. We do not want him permanently positioned near the Jungle Book. Check the call number, 599.757. Right. He should be in zoology. 
Yes, please, right away. Thank you, Mrs. G. Miss G. And like a vanishing mirage, the tiger disappeared. Chapter 3. Of course, even though he was grounded, Kyle Keeley still had to go to school. Mike, Curtis, Kyle, time to wake up, his mother called from down the kitchen. Down in the kitchen, Kyle plopped his feet on the floor, rubbed his eyes, and sleepily looked around the, his room. The computer handed down from his brother Curtis was sitting on a desk that used to belong to his other brother, Mike. The rug on the floor with its Cincinnati Reds logo had also been Mike's when he was 12 years old. The books lined up in the bookcase had been lined up on Mike's and Curtis's shelves, except for the ones Kyle got each year for Christmas from his grandmother. He still hadn't read last year's edition. Kyle wasn't big on books. Unless they were the instruction manual or hint guide to a video game, he had a Sony PlayStation set up in the family room. It wasn't the high-def Blu-ray PS3. It was the one Santa had brought Mike maybe four years earlier. Mike kept the brand-new Blu-ray model locked up in his bedroom. But still, clunkier than that it was, the four-year-old gaming console in the family room worked. Except this week, well, it worked. But Kyle's dad is, had taken away his TV and computer privileges. So unless he just wanted to hear the hard drive hum, there was really no point in firing up the PlayStation until next Sunday when his sentence ended. When you're grounded in this house, his father had said, you're grounded. If Kyle needed a... A uh, computer for homework during his last week of school, he could use his mom's, the one in the kitchen. His mom had no games on her computer. Okay, she had Diner Dash, but that didn't really count. Being grounded in the Keeley household meant that you couldn't do anything except, as his dad put it, think about what you did that caused you to be grounded. Kyle knew what he had done. He'd broken a window, but hey, I also beat my big brothers. Good morning, Kyle, his mom said when he hit the kitchen. She was sitting at her computer desk, sipping coffee and tapping keys. Grab a toaster tart for breakfast. Curtis and Mike were already in the kitchen, chowing down on the last of the good toaster tarts, the frosted cupcake swirls. They left Kyle the unfrosted brown sugar cinnamon, the ones that tasted like the box that they came in. I actually like the brown sugar cinnamon ones. Hmm. New library opens Friday just in time for summer vacation, Kyle's mom mumbled, reading her computer screen. Been 12 days since they tore down the old one. Listen to this, boys. Dr. Yanina Zenchenko, the new public library's head librarian, promises that patrons will be surprised by what they find inside. Really, said Kyle, who always liked a good surprise. I wonder what they'll have in there. Um, books, maybe, said Mike. It's a library, Kyle. Still, said Curtis, I can't wait to get my new library card. Because you're a nerd, said Mike. I prefer the term geek, said Curtis. Well, I gotta go, said Kyle, grabbing his backpack. Don't want to miss the bus. He hurried out the door. What Kyle really didn't want to, to miss were his friends. A lot of them had Sony PSPs and Nintendo 3DSs, loaded with lots and lots of games. Kyle fist bumped and knuckle knocked his way up the bus aisle to his usual seat. Almost everybody wanted to say hey to him, except, of course, Sierra Russell. Like always, Sierra, who was also a seventh grader, was sitting in the back of the bus, her nose buried in a book, probably one of those girls who lived in tiny homes on the prairie or something. Ever since her parents divorced and her dad moved out of town, Sierra Russell had been incredibly quiet and spent all of her free time reading. Nice shirt, said Akima Hughes, as Kyle slid into the seat beside her. Thanks, it used to be Mike's. Doesn't matter, it's still cool. Akimi's mother was Asian, her dad was Irish. She had, a very long, she had very long jet black hair, extremely blue eyes, and a ton of freckles. What are you playing, Kyle asked, because Akimi was frantically working the controls of her PSP 3000. Squirrel Squad, said Akimi. One of Mr. Lemoncello's best, said Kyle, who had the same game on his PlayStation. The one he couldn't play for a week. You need a hand? Nah. Watch out for the beehives. I know about the beehives, Kyle. I'm just saying, yes! What? 
I cleared level six, finally. Awesome. Kyle did not mention that he was up to level uh, 27. Akimi was his best friend. Friends don't gloat to friends. When I shot the squirrels at the Falcons, said Akimi, the pilots parachuted. If a squirrel bit the pilot in the butt, I got 50, I got a 50 point bonus. Yes, in Mr. Lemoncello's catapulting critters game, there are all sorts of wacky jokes. The Falcons weren't birds, they were F-16 Falcon fighter jets. And the squirrels, they were nuts, totally bonkers, with swirly whirlpool eyes, and they flew through the air, jabbering gibberish. They bit butts. This was one of the main reasons why Kyle thought everything that came out of Mr. Lemoncello's Imagination Factory, board games, puzzles, video games, was amazingly awesome. For Mr. Lemoncello, a game just wasn't a game if it wasn't a little goofy around the edges. So did you pick up the bonus code? Asked Kyle. Huh? In the freeze frame there, Akimi studied the screen. Turn it over. Akimi did. See that number tucked in the corner? Type in that the next time the home screen asks for your password. Why? What happens? You'll see. Akimi slugged him in the arm. What? Well, don't be surprised if you start flinging flaming squirrels on level seven. Get out. Try it. You'll see. I will this afternoon. So did you write your extra credit essay? Huh? What essay? Um, the one that's due today about the new public library? Uh, refresh my memory. Akimi sighed. Because the old library was torn down 12 years ago, the 12 year olds who write the best essays on why I'm excited about the new public library will get to go to the library lock in this Friday night. Huh? The winners will spend the night in the new library before anybody else gets to see the place. Is this like that movie Night at the Museum? Will the books come alive and chase people around in junk? No, but there'll probably be free movies and food and prizes and games. All of a sudden, Kyle was interested. Ooh, I'm going to read chapter four really bad, but I'm going to wait. I'm going to wait until tomorrow to read chapter four, but I'm very, very excited about that. That was chapters one through three of the uh, um, Escape from Mr. Lemoncello's Library. I hope you had a good time, and I believe uh, Mr. Farr will be reading tomorrow. Have a wonderful day, everybody. Go Pirates.